This is Elizabeth Melton. I'm the Public Engagement Director for the Institute for Diversity and Civic Life, and I'm conducting interviews with the Loose Foundation's COVID-19 Emergency Grant Network for the Grounded Knowledge Project. We are meeting in the Fetzer Institute boardroom in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and Andrew Davis is our videographer. Today is Friday, June 2nd, 2023, and I'm joined by Sean Sands. Sean, it's great to have you here today. I'm really glad to be here, Elizabeth. Um, so Sean Sands, my pronouns are he, him, uh, and I am the chief of staff at Public Religion Research Institute, also known as PRRI, which was the convening organization for this cohort of loose COVID-19 emergency grantees. Thank you. Yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit about how kind of what those early stages were for the projects and where y'all kind of came in and what your role was. Yeah, so um, if, uh, so our president and founder, Robbie Jones, uh, received a call from Jonathan at Luce um, talking about the need to uh, resource and uh, convene local theology projects. That's when I came into it, that's, what I, that's all I knew. Um, I could not have imagined uh, that the program was, would be so much more than just local theology projects, that uh, it was a program that gave, interestingly, gave us an opportunity to actually do something about the pandemic. Um, I think a lot of us, you, you know, you're doom scrolling or you're watching on television, the beaches are open in parts of the country, people are kind of thumbing their noses at the pandemic. What can I do about it? Um, if in my case, I had the, the honor of convening a group of, uh, you know, community facing uh, divinity schools, seminaries and uh, religious uh, research uh, organizations inside of uh, major universities um, and creating a space for those people to come together uh, first just to get to know one another, then to start to work through some of the really tactical problems. Uh, particularly in kind of a, uh, a regulation heavy academic environment where you can't just write checks. Um, and so, you know, supporting them through that, providing a, a, a container for them to share, well, have you tried this? Did you talk to this person? Um, and then as the program started taking shape, uh, some of you know, these themes that started emerging, the need to document, to storytell. Um, you know, a couple of grantees had storytelling baked into their program. But because of our convening, storytelling showed up in other places. You know, we were able to, um, you know, I don't, I don't think there was any possession. Nobody felt possessive of their ideas, of their program. There was a genuine interest from the get-go to, uh, to support one another and to, you know, I, I don't think we were talking about collective impact at that point. Certainly that's something we've seen um, at this convening in Kalamazoo, but all of the pieces were there. And it's, it's just, for me, it's been very fulfilling to be able to step back, come back to this after two years and recognize that the collective impact is pretty big and I suspect will get bigger as we start focusing on what comes next for these projects. Yes, it's, it's really fascinating to hear all of the networks and connections that, that were made at the local level and at this, this larger level as well. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about some of the specific challenges or things that kind of stood out to, to you as you got to hear kind of the journeys of the, these projects. Sure, well, I think it's important to note that all of these projects, including the role that PRRI played, um, that those projects took place against a really kind of catastrophic backdrop. Um, you know, the first pandemic we've had in 100 years, the first pandemic we've had in the information age, in the age of misinformation. Um, and so, you know, I think one thing that th being here in Kalamazoo has, has prompted me, though, is to reflect on the fact that we all had personal challenges um, as we went into this work. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, I nearly lost my family. Uh, my family nearly fell apart during the pandemic, during the lockdown. And so we were each, you know, we were coming to this work, kind of putting our own personal issues to the side, focused on, you know, how can we, you know, these, these programs where everyone was different, there was no similarity, there was no prescriptive approach, there was no template to follow. Um, and so how do we, putting our personal issues aside, face these huge societal issues? Um, you know, I think, I, I wouldn't say that PRI had challenges other than the fact that we as an organization were also dealing with the pandemic um, with a suspension of grant funding. We uh, had to, you know, uh, reduce our staff. We went on partial furloughs. 
Um, while you know the, the universities and the, the D schools and the seminaries were undergoing the same thing. So it's really kind of an instructive tale about not even recognizing, or not even naming them as challenges, because at that point we all had so many, we were focused on moving the ball and bringing direct support to some of the most uh, vulnerable people in the country. And I think, you know, that's, it's a, it's a strange thing for me to think about discounting challenges, not even thinking about risks. You know, I, I'm, I'm sure Luce did their due diligence and they, you know, they considered the risk that would be involved with such a free form emergency grant program. But, you know, I don't, I, I think the individual tactical challenges that the programs had, getting up to speed, getting money out the door, um, reporting and storytelling, um, those were kind of the individual challenges born out of a love and a commitment for the work, um, out, of, out of a recognition uh, that these community-facing organizations um, not only had an obligation, but also an opportunity um, to support uh, really vulnerable communities during the pandemic. Yeah, you, you just helped me remember, you know, it was such a, a break from the norm and kind of a suspension of time where, where everything kind of existed in a very different um, understanding of, of everyday reality. Um, I'm wondering that kind of within this, I know that right there were those challenges and it was just that kind of everyday making do, getting through each day during the pandemic. I'm wondering if there are also times that this project maybe made you feel celebrat uh, uh, celebratory or hopeful um, were there any of those kind of like big wins? So um, I'll tell you, we, uh, I wrote a status report to the Luce Foundation about halfway through the program. And, uh, you know, they, as with every other component, please do not spend a lot of time on this. Please focus on the convening work, not the administrative requirements. Um, but I felt compelled in that status report to call out these bright spots. Um, you know, uh, it, the project with uh, the Graduate Theological Union, um, you know, they had donated funds to an organization that was getting school supplies, computers, basic resources to kids who were completely cut off from instruction because they didn't have the resources at home. So I, I'm going to say maybe four or five months in, it started to kind of register that for as much doom scrolling as I was doing, um, for as much kind of raging at the air, um, that I was actually able to play a very small role, but I think a really important role in making sure those kids in San Francisco had computers, in making sure that the folks in Arizona who were working on the Journal of the Plague Year and who were documenting these stories through their uh, journalism school, that, you know, that I was able to, to help make that happen. The program in New Brunswick at Rutgers and New Brunswick Theological Seminary. I remember talking to Nate early on and he was so excited because he was able to tell me the, the exact number of diapers that the shelter project had donated in this very short span of time. You know, we're talking diapers, documenting, uh, schoolwork. I was actually able to play a role, a small one, but I was able to play a role in helping the world get through this pandemic. Um, and so for me, that, you know, I, it was a very strong intrinsic motivation for me to do that. Um, right livelihood is a very important thing to me. It's, a, it's an important part of my Buddhist practice. It's why I work at PRRI, to have that opportunity to use my career to do something that makes the world a little better. And so, you know, it, I remember thinking, well, I should probably talk about challenges that the grantees are having in this, in this status report. But I was almost overwhelmed by these bright spots. You know, you take a pot of money, give it to a group of people, no rules. The only rule is you got to get the money out the door um, in such a chaotic environment. And look at what we did. Um, look at what we collectively did. And we each have our own small part that we are playing now by being here in, in, with Fetzer and Kalamazoo, by documenting what went well with our projects, um, where we have additional opportunities. Um, you know, it's, it's strange that a COVID-19 emergency grant from 2020 still has legs in 2023 and from what i've seen here may be shaping people's lives for many years to come yeah i wonder if if you were to to have a conversation with your march 2020 self <laughs> that person that didn't know what was about to happen um, but knowing now what you know and having lived through it 
what um, what advice would you have for yourself? You know, I so I'm st I'm thinking back. I'm standing in my boss's office, and we're like, we're just going to close for two weeks. We're going to work remotely for two weeks, and then what were we thinking? We weren't. We didn't know. There was no information available to us on the other side of that two weeks. Um, you know, so I think having come through all of that uh, with this cohort, with a, with a deeply supportive set of stakeholders, um, you know, I think I would tell myself, focus on the bright spots. If you can't, fo if you don't see the bright spots, find them. They are there. Are you asking the right questions? Are you engaging people in a way that gives them the space to share, you know, in a, in a really chaotic, hectic time for us, to share a bright point in, in, a, in an environment where it is all just really bad news. Um, you know, don't lose sight of that. And I'm, in retrospect, I'm really glad that we focused on those bright spots, especially two years later, um, as we now have kind of artifacts, touch points, for what worked really incredibly well. Yeah, I'm wondering too, so thinking about like if we hold on to that bright spot idea, hold on to this this hopeful notion that then, you know, looking forward, let's let's just imagine that we don't have to go back to that space of the pandemic. But for scholars that that still want to do this kind of work of of engagement and connecting directly with communities, maybe thinking about their role as an academic differently. Um, what kind of lessons do you think you learned during this time that could be helpful to some of these institutions mm -hmm. doing this work? You know, um, I started my job at PRI in 2019, and my and Robbie described the organization, our, our programs, as a three-legged stool, research, communications, and convening. And our, our convening, uh, our experience in convening, uh, we were early on, um, but I have, I keep coming back to the power of convening. You know, we were, in the, in the early days of the pandemic, it was Zoom, it was boxes on a screen. Um, here we are in, we are face to face, we're able to connect in person. And that, you know, that gives us a space to celebrate our successes. It gives us a space, like we saw earlier, to be vulnerable. You know, what does it mean to be an academic in this kind of situation at a, at a divinity school or at a seminary. How does your past life experience, personal and professional, how does that come into it? What are the conflicts? Um, you know, one of the participants today talked about giving himself the emotional space to work through the conflict of two versions of himself. Um, you know, you can, come up, you can come to that kind of realization on your own, but doing it in this kind of safe, convening space really demonstrates to me how uh, the, the power of coming together, the power of uh, talking through challenges, the power of learning, documenting learnings and translating them into, into future actions. Certainly what we've heard, a lot of what we heard today uh, was from professors and academics who work in these institutions talking about the successes and challenges of aligning town and gown, of aligning, you know, a seminary, a grant from Luce, and undefined, almost unimaginable need in the face of a pandemic. Um, you know, and so I hope that this is actually a good framework for all of these people going forward, all of the scholars here, the stakeholders, to realize that, you know, there is a uh, there is immense power in coming together as a group of like-minded individuals where you don't focus on your differences, you focus on what you can accomplish together. I know that may sound overly optimistic, uh, given the circumstances, but I am seeing in real time over the last, I mean, what, 12, uh, eight hours, really, since we got up this morning, uh, how that, how the power of convening and how it can equip um, out the, the scholars and academics who are involved in these projects for the next time they, they need to work with the community on a, on a crisis. Yeah, I love, um, I just, I love that. And I love kind of this, all of the networks that are coming together, all of the stories that are coming together and the threads that we're able to follow um, that are just tied to all these different projects in this, this specific moment. Um, we are coming close to the end of our time today. Um, so I'd like you to, to take a moment and think about, you know, this conversation as 
as a moment in going into the archive, right? As, as that documentation of what this moment was um, and kind of consider what, what do you hope is a, the key takeaway for, for future generations uh, looking back at this time, looking back at this, this moment? Uh, what do you hope they can learn from this? You know, so my answer is informed by the work I've been doing for the last four years at PRI. Um, you know, a, a takeaway that, oh, hold on, it was just there. Um, ask, the last, ask me the last part of that question again. It's going to pop right back in. What, uh, what do you hope these future generations will take away from um, this project? So my work at PRI uh, heavily influences my answer to this question. Um, after the pandemic, right after the pandemic started, uh, we worked with Interfaith America on a series of representative national opinion surveys about religion and the vaccine. How can we use religion to overcome vaccine hesitancy or vaccine objectors? Um, you know, how can we use religious organizations to support vulnerable communities at a time of great need? For me, the message is religion is relevant and valid in our world today. You know, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we released uh, a national report on the state of the, congr the health of congregations. And, you know, we reported that uh, the rise of the nuns, religion is declining. Um, the rise of the nuns, these aren't the habit wearing nuns. These are the uh, religiously unaffiliated Americans. We are moving away from religion at a very rapid speed, but I have a pretty deep and abiding convic conviction that capital R religion is what we need in times where we don't have a shared language, where we don't have a shared framework, where we don't have a shared understanding of religions. Um, you know, look at the, 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 the crisis that's hanging over all of us now, climate change. We have got to find something sacred in nature across all of us. If we don't, we're not going to be able to save our planet. And so I say it's the, it's the unending power of religion. Um, it's something that when the next time we're facing these challenges, I, I'm glad that organizations like PRRI, like the Loose Foundation, like the grantees who are here with us, will be there to answer the call uh, from the standpoint of religion. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, I think with that, we'll wrap up for today.